Hi everyone, welcome today to Miles Show. It's a very engaging show that reaches out to young people. It's what we call a show for young people by young people. And we want to welcome all of you. We talk about diverse issues ranging from issues to do with men and women, mental health issues, relationships, and general life issues. So welcome very much. My name is Noel. I'm a counseling psychologist. I also practice as a life skills expert. And uh, I deal a lot with young people as well, especially students at the college and university level. So welcome. Hey guys, uh, welcome to our other episode today. Today we're going to be talking about understanding depression in men. And with me, I have here uh, Mrs. Noel Dusega. She's a counseling psychologist. She's very good at uh, at her work. She actually has dealt with uh, clients who have had depression, both uh, men and female, uh, young, old. Anyone, anyone who has ever been uh, having depression. So yes, thank you for having us here. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much, Miles, for having me on your show. I'm privileged to be with you today. Thank you. So, so if I can ask, uh, what is uh, depression? And sometimes people confuse depression with uh, being sad. You can also try and tell us uh, the difference between being sad and depression. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, very interesting. There's, there's actually a difference. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to clarify the difference. Now, on a de normal day to day basis, people go through situations that will maybe elicit some level of sadness and irritation and frustration and so on. So maybe as you interact with life or people, they will anger you, they will frustrate you, they will insult you, they will deny you things and so on. And you might also go through that period of sadness. And apart from just one-time interaction, we might also have some repetitive interactions, like maybe throughout the day you're just feeling, uh, maybe you have been denied or you're angry and so on. So it will be normal to bring out that emotion and sadness is actually one of them. So just being sad will be maybe for minutes, hours, maybe to a few days, but it's not something that's happening like almost every day consistently. So the difference between that and depression is that depression is actually a mental health disorder it's, it's, it's considered as a mental illness, and specifically it's a mood disorder. So it generally means that it will affect your mood. Now, the, very specifically, the, for, for one to be considered depressive or having what you call clinical depression or major depression disorder, they have to have experienced a number of symptoms for about 14 days, which is roughly two weeks, consistently, almost every day and much of the time of the day. So you'd look at uh, the hours in the day and the, 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 the days that comprise a week, it will be more, uh, some of, I mean, those symptoms that we're going to talk about will be seen more. So that is the difference. Speaking of uh, uh, syndrome, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, can you also get us to uh, what are the causes of depression and the syndrome that come with uh, having depression? Causes are varied, and of course, one of the common ones we hear about is uh, genetic. Some people are already genetically predisposed. That means if you are born in a family where there's someone who has already been diagnosed with major depressive disorder, maybe a first-level relative, parents, siblings, or even um, uncles, aunties, and grandparents, you're likely to actually suffer from depression. Not everyone, though, it's just the majority of people, and studies have confirmed that. So there's a, the genetic predisposition. The other cause is mostly what you call the social environmental issues. And um, again, we, we have examples of things like uh, early childhood experiences or experiences during one's upbringing, which elicit feelings of anger, feelings of feeling in, you know, inadequate, low self-esteem, and where people are generally just feeling like they do not have 
a space or they're not being themselves. And a lot of times maybe they're not allowed to really express specific difficult emotions that they experience. So you'll find that as they grow older, it becomes even harder to express this. So maybe people learn to mask their symptoms. They learn to just suffer in silence and things like that. And we also generally have what we call adverse childhood experiences, like where people are abused. Maybe they go through very um, either direct or indirect forms of abuse while they, they, they I mean, still growing up. And it could be either sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and so on. Uh, so these are likely to trigger depression as people grow older. And then we also have um, uh, generally things that are happening in the environment and situational causes. So these are events that are happening that could trigger depression. And we have things like maybe major losses. We have seen people who lose a loved one and they get into depression, for example, as one of the ways of just coming to terms with the loss. Or maybe other forms of losses, like say you, you lose a relationship, maybe you go through a breakup, and maybe that relationship really meant a lot for you. You are likely to get into depression. Some people will generally just feel depressive, maybe for days, and they will be okay. But some people will actually get into uh, what we call clinical depression. Uh, we also have other major losses, like maybe you lose, you lose business, you lose your profit, you lose meaning in life. You lose your status, you know, you lose opportunities. Maybe you're really hoping to get your visa and travel abroad and, and you didn't get it. It's, it's, it's likely that you actually, you know, go through some emotions and this can easily lead to depression and so on. Uh, other losses like loss of pregnancies, you know, loss of, lo loss of um, an opportunity and things like that. So losses generally can easily lead to that, but you also have some traumatic situations that could also lead to that. Uh, major changes in life, like diagnosis, people going through transitions and uh, situations they do not understand or they do not know how well to respond to, it could actually lead to depression. And we also have some hormonal uh, imbalances. For example, we, you might have heard of what we call postnatal depression that is mostly experienced by women who have had a baby. And we also have prenatal it's mainly caused by some of the uh, hormonal imbalances in, in life. So generally, we have quite a number of causes. Um, it does not mean that everyone would respond to any of these situations the same way. Some people might go through a loss, and it could even be a major loss, but they don't have to go through depression. Others would. So it's also case by case, and people also react to these situations differently. So the second part of the question you asked about the symptoms. General symptoms uh, with depression, let me put them in maybe three or four different categories. I'll look at physical symptoms. That's basically what's happening in your body. Uh, we look at psychological symptoms. That's mostly what's happening with your mind and with your emotions and feelings and so on. We could also look at uh, social symptoms and behavioral symptoms. Hopefully, I'll be able to capture a majority of them. So with physical symptoms, it's uh, most likely that if someone is going through depression or if someone is having depression, they'll be generally feeling lethargical. They're low on energy, and they, it would show through fatigue and tiredness. So you'll find that maybe someone is just tired. Maybe someone even wakes up in the morning, and the first thing, they're already tired. They don't even want to come out of bed. And they are tired not because they were really engaged or that they were involved in some heavy work that took a lot of their energy. It's just that they are depressed. So it's likely that you'll see that a lot. Uh, sleeping a lot. We, we, we see people with sleep problems. So it's either someone sleeps too much or sleeps very little or, or, or not, no sleep at all. We, we hear of cases of insomnia and so on. Um, appetite is also a big thing for people who are in depression. Most of them will go through what you call low appetite moments, and some of them will completely go off food. They will not be eating, but they are again not fasting, and they have not chosen not to eat. It's just that they are, they are processing deeper things at an emotional level. Um, you will see some significant weight losses, and the weight loss may not be attributed to a weight loss program. It's just that someone is losing weight, either because they are not eating well, um, mostly or it's other lifestyle changes that are really leading to that. Under the psychological category, um, we'll see a lot of sadness. Sadness is a big thing uh, with depression. 
But again, as I say sadness, not everyone who is depressed will be sad. So um, there are some people who will actually be looking upbeat and you know just going on with their lives and so on, but they're really depressed. So um, they will not, it will not be an automatic symptom that you might notice in some people. Some people have even learned ways of masking it. But um, it, it could be reflected even in crying. You'll find that they're crying a lot. Um, maybe just finding moments to cry, uh, sometimes in public, sometimes in private, and so on. And also irritability, anger, you know, um, a, a situation that they would handle normally. You'll find that when they are depressed, it's really getting them agitated and irritated. And they would react with a lot of anger. And um, it, it's, I mean, it's, it will look like it's already overwhelming for them. And of course, we'll see uh, people losing some, some, some. I mean, in, losing interest in activities that they would normally enjoy, that they would normally not have a problem engaging in, and so on. Socially, people would withdraw. Most people who are depressed will withdraw. They'll push away people, and it will either be very direct or indirectly. So either they they cut contact. They don't want to talk to people. They avoid social situations. They avoid any kind of interaction. And so we'll see a lot of that um, withdrawal and isolation. And uh, from a behavioral perspective, you'll also notice some changes in behavior. Maybe they would uh, also start engaging in some substance and drug abuse. So a lot of times when you see people using some substances of abuse, sometimes it could be that they're masking depression and they're, they're just finding a way of, you know, finding an outlet or, or dealing with it. Um, of course, loss of interest. Um, something that happens for majority of people is um, for those who are sexually active, they will start losing uh, sexual uh, interest and so on. Um, and another big factor that we see with uh, depression is that people start being suicidal. So thoughts of suicide, plans to commit suicide and so on is also a very common factor and symptom in depression. And still on the symptoms of uh, depression, yes. now let me focus on the male. Uh -huh. Especially because when you are telling me about some of the symptoms and you know how people cry, I know mostly like uh, ladies are good at uh, expressing themselves. Yeah. But men rarely do express themselves. They say, "Oh, I'm going through this." Mm -hmm. so what are some of the observable symptoms we can mm. see in men who are mm. depressed? Interesting question. And interestingly enough, also some studies have confirmed that there are some differences who are in, in the different genders and even with ages, like maybe a child who is depressed is likely to show it differently from an adult who is depressed and so on. And, and that is also the same for men and women. So I'm thinking about different categories of men. You know, we have um, men who are younger, we have those older ones, we have those who are maybe family men, some who are probably not, men in relationships and so on. So I just generally look at, um, maybe before I, 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 I respond to that specifically, just to highlight a few studies and statistics about depression and especially men and women compared. One of the very interesting statistics is that there's more women who present with depression. So those that present and get treated would be women majority. So specifically with men, you will see, uh, I mean, statistics have confirmed that more men are, um, lesser men are presenting with depression. So the statistics for women are more. But interesting enough, uh, there are actually more men who might not be seeking for help. So I don't know whether to conclusively say the statistics are true, are a true picture showing that women are more depressed. It could be that it's just that a few, I mean, quite a number of men may not be reaching out for help and so therefore the diagnosis for depression for men is not being captured as often as it is for women. Another very interesting statistic is that um, for men between ages 15 to about 39, um, suicide is actually the leading cause of death within that age group, specifically for men. Um, the, another very interesting statistic, again, is that uh, out of every five men who are dependent on substances and alcohol, one of them is actually dependent because they're using it to deal with depression and anxiety. Um, and while we are at that, maybe just talking about some of the common observable symptoms. Now, it is, it is, it is highly likely that a man would generally 
describe how they are feeling in their body. So mostly the physical symptoms to really talk about their depression. So they will talk about a headache, a stomachache, a backache, you know, sexual problems. They'll be talking about fatigue or tiredness and things like that. So it is highly likely that um, the real problem might be seen more as physical as opposed to being uh, a, a depression problem. So whoever is listening to them needs to be very attentive and, 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 and maybe probe further for, for, for them to understand. But generally speaking, again, because of the nature of men, most of the common, the other common symptoms apart from the ones we have discussed is that they will be, will be seeing a lot of anger, irritability, and also some level of violence. You know, and that's why in some families you'll see that maybe the man is beating up his wife and even beating his children uh, purely sometimes because they're depressed. We will also see loss of interest in activities. Uh, some men would uh, express it through work, so they will work and work. Actually, some alcohol workaholics, sorry, not alcoholics, but workaholics are actually uh, depressed. So that's the way they are using. Um, they, they, I mean, they're using work to mask what is it that they're exactly feeling on the inside. And we also see escapism behaviors. Maybe they run away from responsibilities at the family level, at the work level. Um, so at the work level, sometimes we see that uh, men, um, a man would come, will, will miss work, or even maybe come when they are um, intoxicated on, with alcohol or some other kind of drug. And of course, substance abuse. Substance abuse is also one of the biggest ways in which men uh, show uh, depression. Still on men, rather. Yeah. Uh, what can contribute to the underdiagnosis of uh, depression in men? Underdiagnosis is. Um, let me let me just generally say is 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 um, a situation where you have a condition and it has not been diagnosed by a professional. So you have not seen a psychiatrist, you have not seen a psychologist or even a GP who will maybe give you a referral. GP, I mean general uh, physician or practitioner. And uh, so you, you have the symptoms, but they have not been picked by a professional. And for men, mostly it will be because they either don't know. We actually have seen a lot of cases where I am going through certain symptoms, but I don't know. I just think maybe I, I'm, I'm, I'm having difficulties. It's, I'm having adjustment problems. So sometimes it will be because it's pure ignorance. They don't know. And because they don't know, they will not seek for help. They will not maybe think about going to a hospital or going into a mental health facility or going to see a specialist. So they'll just deal with it the way they think is right for them. Um, and of course, the, for some that are aware or maybe have are suspecting that it could be depression or it could be this and that, the other problem, some of the attitudes might prevent them from seeking help. So they would either downplay or mask those symptoms and not really show up for help. So you'll find that the person is dealing with a problem, but it's not been diagnosed. And in some of those situations, you find that they're either self-medicating or just completely avoiding uh, finding some form of help. Do you think, do you think there is a stigma when it comes to men when they are depressed? I think so. And again, not specifically just with men, but generally when it comes to mental health. Actually, it's interesting when we talk about physical, medical, you know, issues, people are more available to seek for help. You know, you'll be talking about, oh, I had malaria and I was treated, or I had typhoid, or I had a headache, you know, or this and that. People will be more willing to talk about it more than when they have a mental health problem, you know. So you'll find that uh, some people would start stigmatizing themselves. And I, I would look at stigma in two ways. There is there's what you call self-stigma and there is what you call external stigma. So where people, other people are stigmatizing you. And most of the time you see some kind of myths and stereotypes that are associated with depression. Uh, and so specifically with men, I, I, I would generally think that the cultural expectation for men is a little bit too much sometimes for them. So for example, most cultures promote you know, masculinity, 
you have to be strong, you have to be a macho man, you know, you have to be on top of the game. You're the leader, you're the one in charge, you know. So, um, and I think for a lot of people and a lot of cultures, masculinity is associated with, with power, you know, with prestige, with, with responsibility, success, you know, and, and, and so on. And so when we put men in that position, most of the time, they are denied that opportunity to really bring out the kind of weaker side. And I'm not saying that depression is an indication that someone is weak. Of course, men are also not immune to, to depression or any mental illness. Anyone can get any of the mental illnesses. So what, what really most cultures would teach and emphasize is that you have to be strong, you know? If you are crying and you're a man, for example, you are a weak person, and I've even seen some very extreme conditions. I mean, situations where someone is told you're behaving like a woman, you know, or a child, because maybe people would imagine those are emotions for women and for children and so on. So you'll find that uh, some men will now be suffering in silence because they have to show the strong side of them, and maybe they will be imagining that if I say I'm depressed, or if people think I'm depressed, then they will be thinking that I'm I'm not able to man up, I'm not able to really measure up and manage my life and be strong enough, and so on. Still on the stigma, um, mm -hmm. from what you've explained, I believe that when someone or a man is uh, stigmatized, he cannot get treated from uh, depression. So what, what, what are the consequences of uh, untreated depression in men? Untreated depression, again, I think is generally as a result of undiagnosed mm -hmm. depression. So you'll find that someone is having symptoms and because they have not been diagnosed, because on a normal, uh, in a normal situation, if the diagnosis was available, then there would be a treatment plan. Uh, but again, some people would uh, maybe have been diagnosed, maybe uh, 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 the least to be diagnosed, but don't follow through with the uh, treatment. So I think for me, the biggest consequence and, and how I'm seeing it, I'm just seeing words before me written in big, bold, underlined, you know, just the word depression is a silent killer. So to me, that would be the biggest consequence that if it is not handled early or if it's not handled well, it can actually be a silent killer. And for some people, it is, it's is—it's actually a killer. For, for real, we, 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 we are also aware that depression is a high, um, it's actually a very high risk factor for suicide. And we also know that some people have actually died by suicide as a result of the depression. So we have actual deaths recorded because of depression. Number two, we have suicidal attempts, which may not uh, eventually translate into complete suicides or deaths, but we have attempted suicides and, and, and some of those cases when captured early can actually be rescued and helped to manage the situation. But also for, for me, the other big consequence is that uh, uh, untreated depression has an impact on the general well-being. So whether you're thinking about well-being in terms of um, occupational well-being or social or physical, psychological, behavioral and so on, generally there's an impact. Now we looked at some of the symptoms, and uh, if, if you just go back and relook at some of them, you, you, you'll realize that they already have an impact on the functionality of the person. And if, for example, someone is not able to show up to work because they're depressed, or maybe um, a, a family is going through a, a, a tough situation because maybe the head of the family is depressed and they're not able to really be there for them and so on. Uh, we, we, we are seeing that now almost all units are literally sinking. So we have this employee at work who is not showing up because they're depressed or maybe who is on sick leave, you know, uh, because psychological uh, conditions are also considered for sick leave, depending on, you know, how the person handles it and how, what, the, what the specialist recommends. We will be seeing, for example, this student, if it's a student, who is not showing up for class and who is missing out, you know, on class interaction or whose performance is dropping because they are depressed. We'll be seeing, back to an employee, who, who uh, will be seeing this employee whose performance has also 
uh, you know, significantly reduced because they are depressed. They are not mentally alert and emotionally alert to really handle the demands of their work. And that also means everyone that is depending on them is actually suffering in a way. Okay, and generally speaking, we'll be seeing that uh, some of the physical conditions are also as a result of untreated uh, depression. So you, um, some levels of, uh, for, for example, high blood pressure, hypertension, and some of the heart diseases are actually attributed to untreated depression and some of the mental illnesses because they are not being managed well, especially at the physical level. And uh, also socially, some relationships would suffer and would actually even be terminated because maybe someone cannot, cannot handle being there in that relationship. So whether it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, or a fiancé, or a husband and wife, you know, they, are, they just don't have the mental capacity to handle that relationship. And therefore, some of them will just, you know, either completely zone out and be absent uh, or just quit that relationship or that marriage and so on. So we have quite a number of, uh, I mean, uh, impact mostly at the social, psychological, physical well-being level, and uh, these ones are mostly attributed to depression. So to the final question, um, how is uh, depression in your treatment? Treatment is, uh, I mean, the, 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 the choice of what treatment means that we are looking mostly at a professional, you know, um, um, intervention. So there, I would only look at two. We have counseling or psychotherapy, and we have medication. And of course, counseling and psychotherapy is offered by mental health specialists. It could be a psychologist, it could be a, a counseling psychiatrist, or a counseling psychologist, or even a clinical psychologist, or another mental health practitioner. And medical care is provided by a psychiatrist. So someone who is able to diagnose and um, recommend medication for, for the patient. And uh, of course, generally speaking, the best approach is a combination of the two, depending on the severity of the symptoms. Some people might be diagnosed with depression and maybe it is mild. So you may not say uh, they need medication at that level. Maybe some level of counseling intervention might be helpful for them. But for those who will be diagnosed and it is severe, uh, it, it's, it, it's extreme, they will need medication and counseling almost, uh, I mean, actually immediately. And both practitioners need to be working together to help this patient. But over and above uh, that, we also have other kind of medical procedures. For example, we have what we call electroconvulsive therapy, ECT in short, which is also offered by psychiatrists. And maybe someone who is practicing psychiatry can be better placed to explain what, what, what that is. Uh, but specifically in psychotherapy, there are specific techniques that are utilized. One of the common ones is what you call cognitive behavioral therapy, which mostly focuses on the thoughts uh, that the person is dealing with. So uh, maybe they are focusing on the negative thoughts and the negative happenings, and maybe that is what is affecting them, that they're becoming depressed or we have what you call interpersonal therapy, which mostly focuses on interpersonal relationships. So maybe you're having difficulty with your, with your social skills, with your communication skills, or at the family level and so on. This kind of therapy is usually very helpful for, for people like that. And we also have problem solving. Some people are depressed because they are not able to make decisions or they don't have good problem solving skills to just manage whatever challenges they are facing. And so when you, think at, uh, 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 when you think of the demands and challenges of life, you realize that sometimes they can actually be so huge that people don't have the capacity to manage, and maybe that is why they're depressed. So if they're helped you know, to learn some of those skills, whether it's problem solving, whether it's decision making and so on, and for them to be able better to manage that, then we, we have a better person who is less depressed. But generally speaking, after, uh, I mean, once we talk about treatment, we are mostly focusing on the psychological, but we also have some other strategies that are useful, especially more at a prevention or at a coping level that someone can do on their own. So looking at your social space, your interpersonal space, your personal space, you can decide maybe I can adjust a few things. Maybe I need to be more open to talk to people when maybe I'm going through a difficult situation or I need to take some break and just rest. 
or maybe I need to ask for help or I need to, you know, reach out and, and talk to a professional. I mean, that, that could be what is demanded for some people. So just finding ways within the person's capacity to really manage and uh, cope with depression. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for this wonderful session. Uh, you really outlined and explained everything so perfectly well. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And to our viewers out there, uh, what I can tell you, especially the men, it's good to talk, talk it out. If you're going through something, it doesn't have to talk right. No one will see you any less. Isn't that right? Yes, yes, it's right. So it's very important if you talk it out. And for the ladies out there, take care of the, the men that you know. Either if it's just your brother, or if it's your boyfriend, or if it's your husband, or if it's just a friend. You never know when someone is going through something. Let us all be there for each other. Thank you for this uh, time, you guys, and see you next time on the next episode.